people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say, that's the bad guy. start with this. In light of Rick Glacier's recent revelation, a figure that he put out, Rick Glacier said via his inside sources that the Gervonta Davis versus Hector Garcia pay-per-view only brought in approximately 61,000 pay-per-view buys. It's all anybody's been talking about the last couple of days. Some are having a laugh, some are having an adverse reaction. Stefan Espinoza's reaction, he said, LOL, it did a multiple of that. Is it possible that that viewing figure is inaccurate or partial intel? Is it possible that the pay-per-view did more than 61,000 buys? And should we take Stefan Espinoza at his word? Let's look at the inconsistencies. It's been approximately two weeks since the pay-per-view aired. It's been approximately two weeks since the Davis versus Garcia fight. And in the subsequent nine or ten days that followed, none of the boxing scribes, none of the boxing journals via their sources, none of them released the figure. Sources are eerily tight-lipped as to how the pay-per-view performed. And that is an inconsistency. In previous years, whenever Showtime and the PBC would do a box office fight, they couldn't wait to tell you how well it did. I remember when Errol Spence Jr. took on Sean Porter. Mike Kopinger produced a figure as to where the pay-per-view was tracking the following Tuesday. Just two or three days after the fight. And it was the same with the Errol Spence Jr. versus Mikey Garcia pay-per-view. It was the same with many of their pay-per-views just a few years ago. But a few years later, the boxing journos, the boxing scribes, and their sources... They're a lot more tight-lipped these days. They don't produce viewing figures anywhere as fast or as frequently as they used to. The rule of thumb is that if you had something to brag about, you'd be bragging about it the way you used to brag about the box office numbers for your box office fights. We see in the subsequent nine to ten days that followed the Davis versus Garcia pay-per-view, nobody released the number save Rick Glacier. It's an inconsistency when you consider that Dan Raphael, longtime boxing scribe Dan Raphael, it only took him few days to produce a figure for the Canelo Alvarez versus Triple G trilogy, that box office fight that took place on the DAZN platform, something to the tune of half a million? His sources gave him a number in just a matter of days, but where are his sources when it comes to this fight, or where have they been, I should say? It didn't take Dan Raphael all that long to produce a number for that box office fight last year. DAZN eventually came forward and dispelled Dan Raphael's inaccurate number, where he told you it only did about half a million they confirmed it did a little over a million in an official press release. And we talked about press releases and how, what's your report? It has to be accurate. So if DAZN's telling you it did over a million, it's because it did over a million. They can't lie about what it did. It's an official press release. So why don't Stefan Espinoza and Showtime come forward with a number? If 61,000 pay-per-view buys is an inaccurate figure, why don't Showtime come forward with a figure the same way DAZN did? Instead of just Stefan Espinoza attempting to condescend in the comments of social media posts. You're saying it did a multiple of 61,000. Give us a number. Give us a ballpark. I don't believe Stefan Espinoza. I don't. The fact of the matter is, if you had something to brag about, you'd be bragging about it. It's been close to two weeks since that fight happened, and not a single one of the boxing scribes have reported a number. Not yet. I don't know if they will by the time that this video is uploaded, though if they do, it took them long enough. If they do go ahead and decide to post a figure now, I can only interpret that as a response to Rick Glacier's figure and the reality action that that got. Damage control, essentially. Short of an official press release like the one DAZN did. You can't even trust the figure. Short of an official press release from Showtime, which we all know we're not going to get. 61,000 pay-per-view buys in a country this size 
is not the year mark of a superstar, is not the year market of a big box office draw. KSI draws better than that with his pay-per-views. What was it? Close to half a million buys, two fights ago, 350,000 buys. Approximately for the last one. 61,000 pay-per-view buys or even double that number. Fuck it, round up. Double it. 120,000 pay-per-view buys is not the year mark of a big box office draw. Triple it. 180,000 pay-per-view buys is not the year mark of a big box office draw. Quadruple it. 240,000 pay-per-view buys is not the year mark of a big box office draw. Even if I play devil's advocate and I entertain Stefan Espinoza's argument that it did a multiple of that. If this thing were tracking at either 300 or 350,000, close to 400,000, we would have heard about it. The same way we heard about the Spence versus Porter numbers just two or three days after the fight. It wouldn't have taken this long to report if that's where it were tracking. We got the numbers for that fight just two or three days after the fight. Not two weeks. You can put out whatever figure you want to put out there now. Whatever you put out there now is going to read like damage control. Because if this thing were tracking the way you want it to track, we would have heard about it the week after the fight. Not two weeks after the fight. Well after the fight. Not after Rick Glacier puts out his own figure. We would have heard about it by now. We would have heard about it at least a week or so ago. So, no, I don't believe Stefan Espinoza. I have no reason to. He's full of shit. So even if I play devil's advocate, multiply that 61,000 buys, how many times times do I have to multiply it before we get to a respectable number? In light of all this hubbub over Javante Davis's would-be pay-per-view buys, this tweet was sent to me by one of the subscribers here on the channel. Content creator Fanon International asked, how is it that Terrence Crawford can sell 120,000 on pay-per-view, Canelo can sell 800,000, Fury can sell 500,000, Joshua over a million, but the Pirates can only find a way to steal the Deontay, Gervonta, and Errol fights? Real convenient. What's he trying to say? Hard to say. Though if there is a disparity between, say, a Canelo Alvarez fight or a Joshua fight compared to a Deontay Wilder fight or a Gervonta Davis fight. It's not because people aren't stealing Joshua fights or they aren't stealing Canelo fights, Crawford fights. They're stealing those fights too. They're stealing all of them. Piracy is an issue that cuts into the buy rate of most anything and everything at the box office. The difference, however, the difference is that, say, a Canelo Alvarez, he has more paying customers than a Gervonta Davis or a Deontay Wilder. Wilder and Errol Spence Jr. The difference is the amount of people that are actually paying to see a fight in spite of how much that fight is being stolen. Because they're all being stolen. They're all being illegally streamed. If this particular content creator's issue is how the numbers are being reported, what's being stolen and what isn't, well, there's your problem. You're asking the wrong questions. Every single one of those box office fights is being stolen. But some of those fighters have more paying customers, more consumers that patronize them regularly. Even though the fight's being stolen. That's the difference. Uh, Canelo Alvarez has a bigger consumer base. Emphasis on consumers, not just guys who sit on social media all day talking about fights then pulling out their fire sticks when it's time to buy one. So they can skip out on buying it and steal it. Not just content creators on YouTube, not just guys on Twitter, guys on Facebook that talk about the fights all day, but when push comes to shove, they don't actually support the fighters that they talk about. They don't actually support the fights. They don't buy them. Wilder's numbers for the Hellenius fight were abysmal. They were far less than I expected him to bring in. I wondered, where was his adoring public? Where are all these guys that love to talk up Deontay Wilder all the time? Because they certainly didn't show up in the metrics for the fight. The fight's pay-per-view buy rate. So, I mean, the answer to this question is essentially, how many paying customers, how many paying fans do these aforementioned fighters actually have? Because that's what tells the story. Following these guys on Instagram and Twitter is free. Making videos about them on YouTube, that's free too. But what percentage of those individuals actually patronize those fighters and fork over their hard-earned cash to see them box, to see them fight? That's the real question. A vocal minority can seem a lot bigger on social media than it actually is in the real world. David Benavidez versus Caleb Plant is a prime example per a tweet from Mike Copinger. David Benavidez and Caleb Plant will meet March 25th at the MGM Grand Garden Arena in Las Vegas on Showtime pay-per-view sources tell ESPN. Big time fight at 168 pounds. Big time fight. It's big about it.
I mean, it's a good fight. It's all right. It's a solid fight. It's all right. No more solid than Bivol versus Ramirez, which wasn't a box office fight, which wasn't a pay-per-view. That's a fight you got to see as part of your regular DAZN subscription. What makes this fight so much better than that fight that you should have to pay $80 to see it? Bivol versus Ramirez was a battle of the unbeatens. Two unbeaten guys in their prime, whereas Caleb, we've already seen him get knocked out. So we're supposed to pay $80 to see Benavidez come in after Canelo, swoop in and reheat his leftovers reheat his dinner am i supposed to be excited i'll tell you what i would have been excited had they done the fight when they should have done the fight years ago in 2019 back when caleb and david were both unbeaten fighters and unbeaten champions that's when the fight mattered this this is overcooked this is over marinated. Both guys reign parallel to each other as champions on the same side of the street, fighting under the same banner. And it was Samson Lukowicz who wanted to wait on the premise that the fight would be worth more later on than it was at that time. But you tell me all these years later, is this fight really worth more now than it could have been in 2019 when they were both unbeaten fighters? Both of them unbeaten champions. Is it really worth more now than it was before? Watching Caleb Plant get slumped by Canelo Alvarez makes the fight more valuable than it would have been when they were both unbeaten fighters, when they were both unbeaten champions. There would have been two alphabet titles on the line. What makes this a box office fight now? What, the fighters' egos? The fighters' financial demands? Why isn't it being billed as a regular Showtime fight? Why is it being billed as a Showtime pay-per-view? For what reason? I didn't have to pay $80 to see Shakur Stevenson unify titles with then unbeaten Oscar Valdez. I didn't have to pay $80 to see unbeaten Dimitri Bivol take on unbeaten Zerto Ramirez. I didn't have to pay $80 to see Devin Haney travel to to Australia and Vi to become his division's undisputed champion opposite the ring, then unbeaten, George Cambosos. None of those fights came with hefty pay-per-view price tags, whereas this fight, this fight is little more than an interim fight, and it costs $80. Better be versus Vozdik didn't cost $80. Better be versus Smith Jr. didn't cost $80. Better be versus Yard. You want to build this fight? as a box office fight and what the consumers are gonna do is they're gonna evaluate whether it's value for money what other fights are they already getting from showtime's competitors that aren't pay-per-views and are those fights the same or better than this fight you might have a vocal minority by way of social media that are seemingly very excited about this fight but how excited are they really what percentage of those individuals are gonna actually buy this thing what if anything is this going to do at the box office because Deontay Wilder, he couldn't even crack 100,000 pay-per-view buys with his last box office fight, and he's more well-known than either of these two guys. Goes right back to the conversation we just had about that content creator and what fights are actually being bought. What fighters actually have a solid consumer base? Benavidez versus Plant is a decent fight, though it does read more like the co-main event to the main event of a box office fight. A main event unto itself. An interim fight. Not so much. And finally, I'm sure most of you've heard by now, Stefan Fulton versus Naoya Inoue, 122-pound championship clash targeted for late spring in Japan. A lot of people are really excited about this, but I'm reserving my skepticism. I have an abundant supply of it. A pound-for-pound -pound showdown is on the horizon. BoxingScene.com has learned that a deal has been reached for Stefan Fulton versus Naoya Inoue's championship fight. Fulton will defend his unified WBC WBO junior featherweight crown versus Inui, who recently vacated his undisputed bantamweight championship in pursuit of winning titles in a fourth weight class. The exact date and location have yet to be determined with a targeted time frame of later on this spring, May or June. In Japan, the stellar matchup will mark the fourth straight in his home country for Inui, while Fulton will fight outside the U.S. for the first time in his eight-plus year pro career. This ain't what I expected. Mostly because late last year, news broke that the people at the PBC and the powers that be had petitioned the WBC at their annual convention to sanction a rematch between Stefan Fulton and Brandon Figueroa. I mean, if the politics of boxing getting in the way weren't enough, surely that was enough to start thinking this fight wouldn't happen. Surely that lended credence to the notion 
prediction that the fight might not happen. Fulton's name resurfaced last November during the annual WBC convention when it was revealed that a discussed rematch with Figueroa would come with the interim WBC featherweight title at stake. The ruling allowed for a four-man tournament to be ordered at junior featherweight with Azat Havanesian, Luis Neri, and Reese Alim, and Alan David Picasso as the suggested semifinal eliminators. Neither fight has yet to materialize, nor were final terms ever reached for Fulton versus Figueroa 2, despite reports from other outlets suggesting a February 25th date for their rematch. When that news broke late last year, Stephen Fulton immediately became the subject of widespread criticism and backlash. So is it possible that that backlash is what caused him to do a full 180, spin the block, and stay at 122 pounds instead of moving up to 126. Comparatively, this is the bigger fight. The much bigger fight with the bigger profile. It's almost too good to be true. ESPN reported on the 18th that Naoya Inoue and Stefan Fulton have agreed to a deal in Japan. The first report on the same day said negotiations were underway. But according to a source, the date and time are undecided. But they are aiming to hold it in May and ESPN+. Plus. The fight will be shown in America by way of ESPN+. Plus in their existing deal with Top Rank, lest we forget that in this part of the world, Naoya Inoue is a Top Rank fighter. Can we take the story at face value? Can we breathe a sigh of relief that between now and May, the fight will take place? The fight will happen. There seems to be next to no involvement from Al Heyman, his PBC, and his broadcast partner, Showtime. Which, from where I'm sitting, is an encouraging omen, a good sign. The less that Al Heyman, the legendary obstruction artist, is involved, the better. If you let him handle this thing, not only will he not do the fight in a timely fashion, it'll be over-marinated, overcooked, and he'll charge you $80 to see it. Look at how long it's taken him to get in-house fights over the line. In-house fights like Benavidez versus Plant. You could have did that in 2019. And what about Spence versus Thurman? Those guys have been on the same side of the street as long as I can remember, but you're only now getting around to making the fight. The less Al Heyman is involved, the better. And it appears that he's not at the helm of promotion. He's got nothing to do with the fight's distribution internationally. Minimal involvement. Next to no involvement from Al Heyman could very well herald this fight coming into fruition. Though, like I said, it's almost too good to be true. And usually when something seems too good to be true, especially in this sport, it probably is. I mean, does Stefan Fulton all of a sudden have the kind of autonomy that... Other fighters don't have? Other fighters at the PBC. Does it really just boil down to the individual? Stefan Fulton going against the grain, deciding that he's willing to travel abroad the same way that Gary Russell would not. When he was offered a million dollars to unify titles with Josh Warrington. This announcement has given us a lot to talk about, a lot to think about, and a lot to digest. Well, my initial reaction? I'm skeptical. Yeah, I'm pessimistic. I'd love to see them get the fight over the line, though I question as to whether or not they'll be able to.